Welcome, fellow travelers, to Fate's Wide Wheel. I am your host, Sam Payne, and I have a very special episode for you. Uh, I am super excited and thrilled to welcome back to the show Deborah Pratt. Of course, if you're listening or watching this, you probably already know who Deborah Pratt is, but just in case you don't, she happens to just be the co creator, executive producer, uh, story editor, writer, um, showrunner for the classic Quantum Leap. She is a current executive producer on the Quantum Leap Revival. She's also directed an episode of the new series, uh, Family Style. She'll be directing an episode coming up as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, Deborah is is Ziggy. Deborah is amazing. Um, she's incredible. She's gracious. She's kind, super intelligent and passionate and creative. And I am always thrilled whenever I get the chance to speak with her. Um, it really is a privilege. And she's had such a big impact on, on my life and uh, the opportunity to get to tell her that, A, and B, also uh, have a conversation with her about things that she's passionate about uh, is always a lot of fun. And in this case, we're talking almost exclusively about her Kickstarter uh, for Warrior One, which is a graphic novel written by Deborah, uh, taking place in a world created by Deborah, sort of an extension of side story uh, to her Vision Quest novel series. Um, so yeah, I, I think that uh, this one, this one's a lot of fun, and I'm I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. Of course, we do talk a little bit of Quantum Leap. How could we not? Um, and in addition to, of course, uh, some of that, we also get to go down memory lane. She has some fascinating stories about her early days, uh, both in theater here in Chicago, which is awesome, uh, and uh, her time, uh, her early days in, in Hollywood as well. So some really fascinating stories and uh, really cool the way that it all kind of ties together with her ideas for Vision Quest. Um, and uh, right now, uh, you can go, you can back the Kickstarter. In fact, you're probably seeing a link in the video right now. Uh, head over there. You can back the Kickstarter. There's some really cool reward tiers um, for both the digital version, paperback, hardback, etc., uh, with lots of other neat little rewards uh, along the way as well. So head over there, back the project, um, and, and, and enjoy, enjoy something that I certainly got to enjoy so much, which was this interview with none other than Deborah Pratt. Debra, welcome back to Fate's Wide Wheel. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, as always. I'm a huge fan, Sam. Oh, of thank you. you. And everything I, that you're doing. I really appreciate that. It's uh, it, it, Every time I see you, it's a little bit of a pinch me moment, to be honest with you. So the fact that this is the third time that you've been on the show, I still I still can't quite believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fan of the show. I've listened to a number of episodes, and I, I really, how you... I like how you get honesty out of people and, and heart out of what people say. And, you know, there's a real connection that as a listener, I think people tie into. So I'm excited about that. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I mean this. This is absolutely not just something to make you feel good. I mean, hopefully it does. But uh, I legitimately got some of that from you. I mean, without without the original Quantum Leap, without your writing and without your work, I don't think that I would be the person that I am today. And I mean that genuinely. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I, and I am grateful because I've heard that from a couple of people. And, <laughs> you know, I'll walk into a big meeting and there'll, he'll, there'll be a young exec and, and he'll say, uh, you know, I want to start the meeting, but before I do, I just need to geek out for a second. I, <laughs> I was watching Quantum Leap with my sister, and we were watching faithfully every, you know, he would say Thursday. But then you moved. I went, yeah, we did. We moved like five times in six years. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would watch it with my grandparents, and we would talk about the fact that they lived through some of the times. Mm. And it became this amazing water cooler show. Yeah. So where people could gather and talk about issues <clears throat> that truthfully many are still relevant today. And Absolutely. I think that's, and, and, and one of the rules of the show was let's lay out both sides of this conversation and not tell anybody what to think, but to say, choose who you are, but listen to the other person, which is so not in the world right now. Yeah, I absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's something that I hinted at a number of times over the past few weeks on the show. There's just, there's been so many horrible things happening in the world right now. And I think that that ability to listen 
and the desire to just sit down and, and talk and have that conversation, regardless of how difficult it is, it's so necessary. And so any reminders we can get of that, um, hopefully, hopefully people will, will start to listen to those reminders so they can start to listen to one another. And it's hard. I get that it's difficult, but it's necessary. It's one of those things too. I mean, what we're here to talk about is warrior one and it's, it's rife, ripe through the entire, um, book in the sense that it's the future. Um, and I'll give my, my little spiel it's earth in the not too distant future. It's a hundred years after the great quakes of 2029, which I thought when I wrote that 30 years ago, it would (laughs) really far away, but now it's not. And the fact that, that there are earthquakes caused by the fracking caused by, you know, the shift of earth, all, all the things that are happening to us. I had a couple of readers in the Vision Quest books that Warrior One um, draws from that world say this book is a prophecy. Mm. Anyway, so it's Earth in the not too distant future. It's 100 years after the great quakes of 2029. Uh, The survivors band together. We unify as a planet and we um, start to rebuild society. It's changed. Uh, Atlanta has risen. Everyone thought it was called Atlantis, but we find out it was really called Atlanta. South America, because of all the deforestation, sank and became underwater cities. Um, but we came together. The society we were building was focusing on heading into being a utopia. We were taking care of the planet. We were taking care of each other. And then we put our genetics into animals. And we created these alternate species. And their humanity was so new to them they remembered all the powers that we had that we forgot. So we bend into fantasy a little bit. And then we put our genetics into machines and they become sentient. And they look at our history. They look at the fact that we are greedy and vicious and racist and all the horrible things that humans can do. And they go, these are not good stewards of the planet. Look what they were doing before the great quakes. We're taking them out. And that's where Warrior One kind of begins. And um, and the, the journey of this lead character, Jetta A, she's this young woman and she has a very good life with her mother, her father, her younger brother. Um, they, in one day, their world is shaken and she is on her own suddenly. And I, I wanted it to be for people right now who, I mean, for all people, but for people who are in their 20s and their 30s who are saying, how would I survive if my world changed mm. in a day? And that's part of what I'm building into the story. Where do you find courage? How do you teach yourself how to build a fire? You know, the fact that um, there's enough alcohol in your hand sanitizer to start a fire. Did you know that? <laughs> I mean, those are the kind of things I want to build in yeah. to the storytelling. And more important, can you hunt? Can you find water? Can you find shelter? Um, and are you willing to pick up a weapon and kill or be killed? And who do people become that she encounters? Some of them are like I said, splicers is what the, the, you know, ultra species, alternate species is. But we also did some cloning, the things we're playing with right now. So there are clones out there and how are they manipulated and all that kind of story stuff. And uh, again, this is the first book in a series of books. My hope is that it instills hope um, that we can come together, that we can unify, that we don't let our... Um, differences pull us apart we let them pull us together because now it's man against machine yeah so you don't have time to look at what color someone is or what beliefs they have and in the society that i invented uh or created in the vision quest series you know we had to merge religion into one religion so that we all stood together so it's it it took me eight months to write the Bible for the vision quest to determine what was money, wow. what was medicine, what were um, uh, religion, 
how did we uh, get rid of oil? What replaced mm. oil? Um, how did we use the uh, sea rise to, uh, to help sustain the planet? Instead of being fearful of it, we embraced it and, and made changes. And those are the kind of things that I'm hoping the A, the vision quest opens that conversation, but the, the idea that first I want to do the graphic novel, then I'm looking at to do a series that is like no other series that I can't go into detail yet, but like no other series you've ever seen. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then a video game so that you can actually be in the world, in the series. Yeah. And then together a portal into the vision quest world where we can build the future together. Those are the, that's the map of the trajectory of this and Jetta A and um, the warrior one saga and the warriors. If you come to um, warrior, well, we, had, we just started building um, warrior one world.com. Uh, but if you go to like, I'm doing a Kickstarter because this is way more expensive than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh we're still in a strike and so i'm asking people to come be a warrior come join us and you know there's some really cool things but but come in and look at <clears throat> what elements the story has a lot of them i've pulled from the the lore of the vision quest books but some of the artwork i mean i, I hope we get to see uh, it within this um interview the the book cover for warrior one i think it's gorgeous art will will yes. is probably one of the best artists in the industry uh david capiti is doing he's putting everything together and took the script that i wrote and adapted it uh helped me adapt it to the um to the format of a graphic novel and then <clears throat> uh candace han who's this amazing woman who's doing the coloring and catherine is doing our uh, lettering. And all those are coming together and we've got like a gorgeous slip cover that's happening and we've got posters and we've got all that kind of great stuff that you can only get as part of the, the Kickstarter. But more important, it's the conversation of who are you if the world changed tomorrow? What do you know? How do you trust? How do you survive? All those pieces, I think, are what will make this really fun and fascinating and a good conversation piece so that once we get to the series and once we get to the game, which, you know, we've got interest from um, Epic Games, which I'm very excited about. I think the Unreal yeah. Engine is probably one of the most brilliant pieces of technology I've ever experienced in my life. Absolutely. I mean, so that's what I'm inviting people to, to come with me. And it has the central thing that everything I write has, including Quantum Leap, which is hope. And the hope that we all get home, that we all get together, that we're unified into a, a really wonderful consciousness that can make the world a better place. Well, I, I love that. And I have a lot of questions, but uh, I'll start with, which I, which I think kind of goes hand in hand with what you're talking about, and especially the idea that creating this piece of art, sharing this piece of art, growing it out into all of these ways that people can engage with it, while also having this kind of, you know, almost utopian ideal of being able to bring people together and get people to actively engage with how we can change our world for the better and how we can come together to do that and create, you know, the better world for, for all of us to live in, for our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, great grandchildren, etc. And something that, that really struck me is in the very first Vision Quest uh, novel, The Atlantean, um, it opens with a quote from Einstein. It says, science and art are the only effective messengers for peace. And I love that. And I think that with so much of what you just said, being able to take that piece of art and maybe, you know, perhaps push it towards embracing that science, like you were even talking about within the books, the idea of kind of looking at, at climate change and looking at the things that are happening around us. And instead of fighting it or denying it or whatever, embracing it and figuring out ways to kind of embrace that change and, and, and go with it. Um, I just, I think it's, 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 it's a, 
sure it's a lofty thing, but I think it's something worth doing. So, you know, my question would be is that because you've already written these novels and now you get the opportunity to do this graphic novel and kind of relaunch this world in a way, um, have you made any changes? Is, is, is Warrior One kind of like a, a reboot or is it a, a sort of a spiritual successor to the original novels? Does it fit in with the novels and is still a part of that same story or is it a, a little bit different from that? Um, it's, it's hmm, what's the best way to describe that? It is a story thread, let's say pulled from the Vision Quest. So in the Vision Quest novel, you meet her mother and brother. Okay. And her journey is, I got to find my mother and brother. Their journey is, we got to find Jedi. A. Oh, cool. Okay. So, you know, I guess if, if I were going to compare it to Star Wars and the Mandalorian, that's a story thread of a culture. Um, it's the closest. And I, I mean, I did it years before Disney did it. Right. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's something else that I had heard is that this idea of this world and, and, and this story, like this goes back to when you were you were young, when you were, you know, like a teenager, right? Like that's when you first sort of thought some of this stuff up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was it was pretty abstract when I was like 13. But when I was 21, um, I, I had some experiences where I before I went into show business, I was a preschool teacher in the inner city in Chicago. And oh, wow. I had some kids in this, this project and literally it was shooting out on the quadrangle. You had to close the curtains, you had to get down. Hmm. And they were little kids who had never been to the museum or been to uh, any of the museums, you know? Um, and so I would tell them stories and I would tell them stories about the power of one the different things that you as an individual can do with the people around you. And they used to love the stories. And it really, as the more of the story that I told, the more of the vision quest came out. So that when I did get to uh, Hollywood, I did kind of a, a American Idol audition, probably before America, well, way before American Idol but it was like a nationwide search for girls to be on this NBC show. And I, I had been, I, I told my parents when I graduated a year and a half early from college, I said, I want to take a year off. And they thought I was going to go say and see the world and go to your <laughs> show business. And they went, Oh, okay. For a year, you can do that. for a year. And, then you <laughs> And in that very short time, I think I auditioned for two shows. I got both of them, Godspell and a show called uh, uh, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope. And the first night my parents saw me, they were surprised. They had never seen me sing or dance or really anything. I and mean, they heard me sing. They knew I had a voice. And I had a, I had a wild range. I had like Minnie Ripperton kind of uh, Mariah Carey four octaves to play with. Wow. And... Um, my mom said, oh, look, I saw in the paper that today they're having this audition. And I went, well, I just got this job. I don't think I can leave. And she said, well, don't you want to just see what television is about? And I said, yeah, yeah, I do. Never thinking. I thought I had a job. I was fine. I go downtown, <laughs> 500 women. Mm. Literally eight hours later, at like five o'clock, it's me and one other girl. Wow. And I know I got to be at the theater in, in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, I, I, I have a job. I have to go. This has been really fun. And, and the, um, the producer of the show walked over because there was a choreographer and the musical director and all these other people across the table and said, well, don't you understand what we're on, what we're uh, offering you? And I went, well, you haven't offered me anything yet. But when you do you have all my information and I have a job, so I hope you respect that. And I don't know if I can curse on the show, but of course he looked at me and said, where'd you get that fuck you attitude? And I said, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> said, well, I'm the producer. I said, well, I'm a working actress who happens to sing and really dance. Well, hire me. He says, I'm going to bring you out to Hollywood and I'm going to break you. And I went, bring it on. <laughs> I got to work. <laughs> uh -huh. Two weeks later, they flew me out. 
Wow. I got the job. I got to meet the Rat Pack. I sang with Dean Martin. I wow. met Sammy Davis Jr. and Frank Sinatra and danced with Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor. Oh my gosh. I mean, just crazy, wonderful stuff. I mean, and then yeah. there's like a whole Star Wars story where I first tried to pitch the Vision Quest to the head of Columbia, Peter Uber. And uh, I said, I've got this, you know, we, we were, I was on a show called The Starlets, one of the first reality shows. I have some strange firsts. I did the first music video with <laughs> Michael Nesmith that won an Academy Award. And I did the first kind of reality show, I think. Anyway, so I'm sitting across from him, they're setting the lights. And I said, could I ask you a question? And I started to pitch him this, it's Earth in the not too distant future. And he, I start getting into the characters and whatnot, having no idea what I'm doing. And he mm. said, stop, science fiction is dead. Mm. And I went, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, director, what's his name? George Lucas, he just came in with this science fiction piece and I turned him down. Everybody in town has turned him down. I said, well, who is it? I said, George Lucas. And he did American Graffiti. It had just kind of come out. And uh, I said, well, what's the name of the sci-fi film that everybody's turning down? He says, star something. Star. I don't remember. I don't remember. So I go on the hunt. And finally, he remembers um, for Star Wars. And I found somebody, I think maybe six months later, 20th Century Fox bought it. Mm -hmm. And I found a friend who was a, a lawyer and I said, do you have a script in your files by this George Lucas and named Star Wars? And could I get a copy? And he went, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> me, I wish to God I could find it. Oh, yeah. Page script, the original script where I don't think R2D2 and C3PO existed. They were like Ewoks, 10 Ewoks and a 10 page. Wow. Trailer. And it was like, wow. Very cool. And then maybe two years after that, as a fluke, I ended up singing and dancing in Debbie Reynolds Vegas show. Mm. And um, she would do costume changes and myself and two other singers would come out and then we would dance with the chorus. And I was over at the house the, to do a costume fitting the day Carrie Fisher got Star Wars. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Carrie came down the steps and I went, Carrie, you got Star Wars. Because I had actually called up north to say I'd like to audition for Star Wars. And I don't know to this day if it was George Lucas that answered the phone, but the voice came back and said, Are you Irish? And I went, What? <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I, does black Irish count? <laughs> Anyway, so Carrie's standing there saying, um, as I'm just thrilled, and she goes, uh, oh, Star Wars, I mean, science fiction is dead. And I went, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All the books that people have written, and, and um, yeah, there was a little a fun exchange after, uh, after that with her mom, who said, you know, she had made a phone call on Carrie's behalf and probably Todd is the only one left that knows the truth. But I sat there and looked at her and I went, you mean that's how it works? She goes, baby, it's who you know. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so I felt like when I saw Star Wars, when it came out, because I tracked it all the way to the movie, I saw it probably before everybody else in the world because I was waiting for it. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, he, he really got the hope, yeah. you know, in the force. It was all there. And so I guess I don't have to do the story that my universal energies have been beating into my head. You have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and so I put it aside for a long time. And then I realized he forgot kind of after that first movie, he forgot a lot about the heart that was in that first film and the hope that was in that first film. Yeah. And after Quantum Leap, you know, my journey was to learn how to do the things that he had done to make those movies, which I feel I still have not done. Um, and I'm hoping the Vision Quest and definitely Warrior One opens that door for me even, even now. And um, I think we need it now more than ever. We need hope. We need uh, unity. Those are the two words that 
that I always try to um, fill my stories with. And Warrior One is filled with hope. I mean, we're fighting. It's got action, um, but it's not gratuitous action. It's survival action. Yeah. That, you know, one of the things that, that's very striking um, about the Warrior One graphic novel uh, Kickstarter pages, you go, you know, you'll see some pages and, and I'll put some pages up right now for, for the viewers as well. And I, I love, I mean, you mentioned Will earlier that, I mean, his style, I think, fits so well with the world that you've created and, and it looks amazing. Um, the character designs, I'm curious as to, you know, how much input you had, did you, did you tell, you know, him exactly what you wanted? And then he went off and, and kind of drew it up and now you can see and approve stuff. Was it a little bit more collaborative than that? Or did he maybe show you stuff and then you like, Oh, I want that. You know, that's what Jenna looks like. I'm, I'm curious what the character design process was like. Well, you have to remember, um, from when I started really working on it in 2001, I started developing with artists concept art of the splicer, mm of the creatures. We, we now have alternate creatures that are here on the planet because I think the storyline was there was a virus that was brought down from the moon and it, it destroyed most of the domestic animals. And so people miss their dogs and their cats. And so people started blending the genetics and those elements, I wanted to see what they looked like. Um, so I had a lot of artwork. Also, I wanted to show what, what the, a rebuilt world would look like. And I wanted it to be very organic. And I remember talking to those artists saying, they said, well, what do you mean organic? And I said, well, like if you planted the design plans in the ground and then the, the buildings grew and they said, oh, Antonio Gaudi. And I went, mm. oh, I've heard of him. I literally got on a plane and flew to Spain and looked at his work and that's what wow. I wanted the world to look like. So I had m all kinds of artwork done on um, what uh, Laser, our lead character looked like, mm -hmm. what Kyla looked like, what Cashton looked like, what the responder looked like way before cell phones. I had given them this responder that I'd still love to make for sure. And I'm, I'm sure will come out really soon in the sense that you know you you carry this around anyway why not wear it right so um so creatures we had cityscapes and I, then i built a website and in that website i had you could go to um tosadai which was a school where the pol the politia went to to train um and then you could go to san Gelino. San Francisco to San Diego, including Los Angeles in between, became one city state. And it was altered too by the quakes. And, uh, you know, there were banners that I had created. I mean, I was deep into this. And, and actually between book one and book two, you'll see in the beginning of book two, I asked people to write a character, create a character and write it in these blogs. And then I said to everybody, because if you're, one of your powers was that you could read auras so that you could tell when people were truthful, you could see the colors that they were, which kind of you can, when people get angry, they turn red or burgundy, depending on your skin color. Sure. You know, when, when people are healers, they, they have a hue of, of green to them. When people are, are speaking the truth, you know, each of them, and I like literally, I, someday I'm going to let this 80 page Bible out. <laughs> anyway, I gave him that. And then I shot a short film uh, with Turan Belisario and a woman named Mary Wells that was the center of Warrior One. I only let it out to one film festival. It won seven awards, but I couldn't afford the, the uh, visual effects that I wanted to do. And I kept saying, oh, I'm going to just put it aside. And when I get the money, I'm going to go back in and redo all the visual effects. So he had a 15 minute short film. He had, um, and Troyan is kind of a combination of me and Troyan is Jetta A anyway. Okay. Um, he had things to go with and then he took them and I, I don't know, he brought a whole other life to them. And this is the, the value of, of working with an artist like that. He reinvented the black guard. I love the design that he did. 
Yeah. Because even looking at the at, at the designs that were on the Vision Quest, because if you go to the visionquest.com, you can still see a lot of this like you know legacy content that you're yeah. talking about right now. Um, and there's some lovely stuff like there's you know Troy and as as Kyla in one of the photos, for instance, and um, and and in the blog section you can see the designs for the Black Guard, and then seeing them for the graphic novel, it really plays into some of what you're talking about with that sort of techno organic kind of feel, like that you know that that these things weren't just built, but they were also kind of grown and i and i I love that idea and and it's it's interesting the way that kind of technology and and the organic components of life sit you know side by side in 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 this world um you know based off of what i've seen not only from the pages from warrior one but also just in in what i've read from the vision quest um so you know you mentioned obviously iphones and, and and stuff like that i'm curious as to what you think about the way that we currently utilize technology and and interact with it as opposed to perhaps the way that you know people do in the warrior one universe um i think there is a certain similarity but the but the reality that and i think it comes out really well in warrior one is the sense that we rely on it so heavily yeah so it's 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 altered our ability and our imaginations in a lot of senses mm. when you think of how much power science fiction has had over the world when jules verne wrote voyage to the bottom of the sea nobody thought about a submarine that could go to the bottom of the sea when he wrote um what was the one uh something to the moon what was mm-hmm. the name of that? nobody thought about it but after someone with a science fiction mentality puts it out there, someone with a science fact bank of knowledge says, huh, how would you do that in reality? So I think art inspires life in that respect. And you look at Star Trek. I had for years a flip phone that looked like a communicator to me. (laughs) Right. (laughs) My duty as a science fiction writer to, to come up with things. So there are a number of things in uh, the Vision Quest books, and we'll see them in um, the Warrior One book too, that I think I've written to inspire people to make happen in reality. Because I think we as humans, what's that line from Starman? We are at our best when things are at their worst. Mm -hmm. And I also, to, to go back to what you're saying, I think it's important for us to not become reliant on machines. Yeah. I, I and that was that's why the challenge in in the books, in all the books, will be: can we as humans remember our powers before the machines build their army? Can we unify yeah. and remember our powers? It's it, well, and it's 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 chilling because I think that we get so many reminders in this day and age of of the way that you know technology does dominate our our life, and and whether or not you know we choose to look at something like Warrior One as a metaphor or a, a cautionary tale in that respect, the idea that you know our lives could be at the at the mercy of machines in in some way eventually if we're not careful i think is an intriguing one and it is very much you know a question of the now um you know in spite of warrior one taking place in the future i mean that's a question that i think we have to wrestle with now and that's like you were saying it's what any good science fiction does is it, it it helps us to you know to ask those questions if not answer those questions it certainly helps us to look at those questions um that that are very much of the now as opposed to oh i can think about that later um, <laughs> i wanted to go back to the character designs for a moment because something else that that kind of called out to me was the idea that in um in the novels and again if you go to the visionquest.com you can see this laser who's sort of the protagonist of those novels um you know the, we see kind of your your standard young all-american white male and in well, actually, warrior if you read deeper he's not he's native american okay okay so the um so the the, the reason why I, I i mentioned that is because i was kind of going off of the picture that's on the that's on the website um and i have not gotten that far in, in the book yet you know uh, unfortunately is? but uh, who is it ethan peck 
Oh my gosh, it is. Uh, I knew I knew I recognized him and now I that's fantastic. Wow, that's great. <laughs> like I recognized Troy and right away as Kyla, but I was like, who is that? I know who that is. Um, well, now I know. Um, but but the, the, the point that I, I was trying to make and the question that I wanted to ask is that I, I love that with Warrior One and you already mentioned kind of the diversity just in general and, 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 and coming together, you know, regardless of whatever our differences are. But obviously in Warrior One, you put a, a young woman of color front and center as opposed to um, you know, having to be a, a, a young white male or, or appear to be a young white male or whatnot. And I, I, I'm curious as to how important that choice was. And if, if that was always a part of your plan for this, um, or at what stage that kind of entered into things. Uh, when I originally started writing the vision quest, Kyla was the lead character. Okay. And that was kind of in the nineties. Um, when I was first talking about it and everyone said, went, don't do that. Don't make a female mm. lead. Never go anywhere. And it scared me. And I sure. went, oh, okay, yeah. And I knew how many times I had tried to get a, a, a woman in a lead role. I tried to get a woman of color in a lead role or a man of color for that matter. Yeah. And the kickback and, that I got from studios was, that's absurd. And the line from... Uh, everybody was, um, well, you know, leads of color do not sell overseas and there's so much hatred overseas. So it was blocked in a way. So I, I shifted the best friends, which were Kyla and, and rather than make, and I still wanted to deal with, with racism yeah, uh, because she, she is confronted, uh, very early in the book by the fact that she's, you know, a, a splicer. She's part right. creature, part human. And um, and I thought that was really important to be able to talk about it, but from a different perspective. And I looked at her telling the story. There, there was there was a version of her telling the story of she and Lager and Cashton, who was who was brown as well. Um, but they were each individual and I wanted them mixed. They're of mixed persons because I think that's what's happening more and more and more that's freaking a lot of people out. But sure. eventually maybe we'll just get to be all golden. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you can't be mad at anybody because they're all, I mean, we're all blood is red. We got yeah. two eyes, two ears, a nose, a mouth, two arms, two legs. And it, and I used to joke all the time saying it won't be until some alien comes down with, four arms and you know two heads and it, we all go oh no we're human we're human and you don't care what that other weird looks like because you right. just want to make sure that our fear of anything different from us is something that we also need to discuss we are yeah. not the only beings in this universe and another conversation Right. <laughs> um, which, you know, it's, it's interesting because that also makes me think about the way that you've, you've created this lovely map um, and uh, it, it shows, you know, the state of the world um, in, in the Warrior One universe. And I, I, I love I, I love the idea of maps in general. But one of the things that I think seeing this reminds me is how how futile it is for human beings to draw these imaginary lines across land and try to separate everything um because you've, you again you've created kind of this beautiful world where things have been reordered you know part of it out of uh, out of just the the you know the natural consequences of of, of climate change and earthquakes etc but but also um because there are you know new peoples coming together or are falling out and whatnot so i i've uh, i've never gotten to ask anyone this question before and now i'm excited that i get to do it what goes into building that map, you know, and actually drawing all of that out? I mean, obviously you have, you know, the globe to, to draw from, but, you know, how did you do that? And can you talk a little bit about the different, you've already mentioned a couple of them earlier, but can you talk a little, little bit about some of the different locations in this new world that you created? Oh, yeah. Um, the two continents that rose were, myth were considered mythological continents, Atlantis, which is truly Atlantia, and Mu. So there's the same kind of story of an island off Japan called Mu that mm. also sank 
during some uh, earth upheaval. Um, and I think I was angry at the deforestation of the Amazon hmm. and that it keeps getting worse and worse and worse and the desertification of um, Africa and the United States as well that I think can only harm the land in that way. And I looked at all that. Actually, there was much more destruction. I divided the earth because the people think the San Andreas Fault is the big quake line. It isn't. It's the New Madrid Fault that runs down the Mississippi. And if that mm. ever quakes, so I literally, I did my homework. I looked <laughs> at, at where the um, quake lines were where the tectonic plates crossed and it made really sense to me. And I think, you know, I wanted to bring in sea rise, even back then we knew about sea rise in the seventies and we were actually good, talking about doing something about it. And then, you know, people came in, Ronald Reagan to be precise. And uh, they went, Oh, that's just fake. That'll never happen. Or if it happens, it'll happen a million years from now, that kind of thing. But there have been people fighting this fight for a very long time. Yeah. So I did not actually go as far as I wanted to, because I wanted to give hope to people. And even though South America sank, we domed it. So now we have domed underwater cities. And it's really funny. I was just talking to someone last night, Turkey, I believe it is put in an underwater freeway. Wow. I, I got, yeah, I got to look into it. Yeah. And it, and I, don't know where, I know it starts in, um, I think, Istanbul. I don't know where all it goes, but it goes under the ocean. We wow. are getting there. This is happening. That's what's so prophetic about the Vision Quest. And yeah. I, But it's such a complicated story because I tried to tell the story of the world and it was important for me to simplify it and make sure. it the story of one person and their journey. But you got to see glimpses of what the world could be and then start the conversation of now, how do we make this world? I mean, you were talking about um, our reliance on technology. And the other day I was watching some clip and it showed Ford or one of the manufacturers and the arms coming in doing the repetitive work over and over and over again, just rows of these mechanical arms. And somebody sent me, and I don't remember where they sent it from, but it was Amazon. Mm. And they had their first robot. And the robot's job was to receive a cue from a piece of paper or whatever, whoever brought in to pick up their stuff, scan it, turn around, it would go out to the factory and then the package would be delivered and the robot would pick up the package and bring it to them. It worked for 15 minutes. And then at one point, you know, they sped it up and showed it go back and back, back. And then at one point it went to grab the package and stopped. And I, I knew what was coming and then it just collapsed. Mm. And it was almost like it realized this is my life. Mm. This is it. And it died and they couldn't fix it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. So if we're talking about using machines for slave labor, for all the things that we're creating them for, to care for us as we get older, for places like Japan that don't, you know, the younger population is leaving and they need somebody to care for their elders. We're going to have to come up with digital rights for, uh, for machines. Yes. Right. And I don't think that can be owned by one group of people or another group of people. There has to be, a, a, again, a collective consciousness of, of what they can and what they cannot do and what they have to do, um, for us. And that anybody can, can create that assistance in them, with them, for them, because if, the top 1% or 3% or whoever they are, all control them. That leaves very little for the rest of humanity. So we, yeah. we need to find a balance. 
And well, you, would, if, you, you could only hope that the technology would realize how imbalanced that, that world is, that, you know. That's <laughs> vision quest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where they go, wait a minute. Right. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. And, and I, believe that, I believe that they are here to stay. And the question is, how do we uh, work together? Yeah. Well, I certainly, I mean, with all of the big questions surrounding AI right now and, and clearly having just come off the writer's strike, still being, you know, under the SAG strike. And, uh, you know, I, I know that there's a lot more to it. And I think that that's sometimes something that, you know, people might forget because I see AI mentioned so often, but it is obviously an integral part of both of these strikes. And the notion that just because, you know, you have access to this thing, it, it, it's, you know, how do you how do you reasonably and, and equitably use it in positive ways without it, you know, trampling on the rights of the people that are here working now doing, you know, doing these things. Um, and, and, and how do you also hopefully try to measure and not take advantage of the AI? Because whether or not we put an artificial in, in front of it or not, it is intelligent. And whether or not it can ever develop its own self-awareness or anything, who knows, maybe that's just in the realm of science fiction. But you have to think that any, any, you know, thing that can learn, anything that can grow will eventually be able to formulate its own ideas and opinions. And, and whether we can equate that with feeling or not, I don't know. But um, I'm curious, uh, uh, and I don't know what you can say or want to say or not, but I am curious as to what your thoughts are on AI and the way that AI uh, could be used in art specifically in the way that some people clearly want to use it to replace human beings. Well, since AI is taking from human past history art, for example. Oh, I'll give you a, a really good example. What happened to the music business when sampling changed everything? Sure. People were just taking it and using it. And somebody went, I don't think so. So what they found <laughs> out was an equitable way for the musicians that had cr created those those lines of music and words of music that were being repurposed to get a share of the success of that um, song, the new song that was created from it. I think that's all that has to happen. Hmm. So if you write a book and you, there's some idea that that machine knows exactly where they took that information from much better than any of us it goes out and assimilates it, they can identify it. So share, share in the profit of whatever it becomes, everybody gets a piece. That equity would humanize everything. Yeah. That's, that's the answer for me. Because once we can share in the wealth, everybody benefits. So if you wrote a book or painted a painting, somebody said they, they saw uh, uh, an AI, probably mid-journey image, and you could see in the corner of the image, Vincent Van Gogh's signature. Mm. So it knew exactly where it took it from and didn't think anything of it other than it was another piece of art to be integrated into the all overall vil vil uh, visual that yeah. it was created writing the same thing. If you say to a piece of AI and communicating with them is, is, is what we're starting to just starting to understand, you know, write me a script in the vein of James Cameron mm. about blah, 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 blah. They're going to pull from James Cameron right. or whoever yeah. it is that you have told them to do until they make the decision themselves. Well, it would be better if it was from, you know, Whoever, sure. I, so I, but but the the uh, equitable exchange, so that everybody benefits. You know, I it was funny right when the strike started and and the 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 uh, studios were saying things like ah let them lose their cars let them lose their homes right. And I read they don't understand that they're the most vulnerable. They do nothing. Right. <laughs> they can be replaced like that. And so I literally went to chat GBT and I said, if I, as a writer went and got a director or I decided to direct and an actor and a cameraman and a DP and, 
And I went through the whole list of everything and everyone that it takes to make a movie. Uh, and then I said, made a movie and wanted to distribute it. Could you create a streaming process for me or a streaming platform? For mm. me? And you know what came back? Absolutely. <laughs> that was the first word period. Absolutely. And then it kind of, you know, it, it started to lay out what would have to happen, code and all this other stuff that it could do. And, and then in the end, it, it backs, it stepped back and went, but of course we would need human people to do this, 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 and this, and we would need right. humans to do this, this, this. And I went, these people don't have a clue yeah. that we, the masses don't need them. Everybody's tired of streamers anyway. Yes. Networks. Especially with all the price hikes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So get ready. Yeah. I mean, you're not the only one that has superpowers here. No. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting too, because like, obviously I love physical media. I mean, you can see behind me, but one of the things that I love these days is that you have so many smaller labels that are out there that are, you know, licensing films or picking up rights to films that have maybe, you know, fallen out of control by large, larger studios and producing, you know, these lovely, you know, versions of these films, um, you know, lovingly put together because it's something that they care about and they want to preserve this film and they want to preserve it along with the, the thoughts of the people that work on the film so that it's not just the film but you get the audio commentary and you get the behind the scenes comments or an interview here or there or whatnot and i think that that is that sometimes that's one of the things that you know these larger corporations they 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 don't understand that aspect of it because they do they just look at it as this as this commodity it's just this thing to be bought and sold and it's not necessarily they don't see it as art and it's the difference in so many ways between regardless of whether or not these were good people or good personalities or easy to work with that at least at least there was a time when Hollywood was controlled by people who were artists first and business people, men, businessmen, let's be frank, businessmen second. And, 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 and I think that that like, that is something that is so very different today compared to 50, 60, 70 years ago when, you know, the, those people that owned and controlled these studios, they, they cared about the art, you know? And, and, and I think that, now it's just a product and 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 that is part of the thing that has to that has to change you know and and and, and having smaller companies step up and seeing and i've sung their praises on the podcast before but seeing like a company like a24 step up and you know and say like hey yeah we'll come to terms like we we want to make movies you know we want to create art so let's do that i think is lovely and when you see people like adam driver at the venice film festival saying hey if you know if these companies can do it why can't apple why can't amazon why can't you know and 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 it's and it's absolutely true it's it, it's it's a case where they don't seem to understand that they are far uh, uh, outweighed by the people that, that, that do create and the people that want to create and the people that want to support that, you know, that creativity. Um, so it, it becomes, it becomes just a question of it's only a matter of time. And, and how long do you, how long do you want to play the villain? Because I, that's really what it appears more. I mean, to me, it was like that from the get go, but like even people that might not, might've been on the fence or might not have understood the dynamics of it when the strike started now, how can they not see, you know, the Bob Igers of the world as, as, as being anything other than like the villain in this scenario. So I, I think that when, yeah, especially when you approach technology and the way that we use technology and the streaming services and AI and that sort of stuff, that there's a way to do it that can be equitable. And there's a way to do it that doesn't sacrifice the art and the creativity of the people involved. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, and I think one of the big changes that occurred were when nobody wanted Star Wars. Mm. <laughs> when it went, oh, yeah, we'll do it. And George said, well, I don't want to give you the sequel rights. And they went, it'll never be a sequel. And I don't want to give you the merchandising. Mer merchandising, what's, who cares? Right. <laughs> That's why he's a billionaire today. And they learned that lesson and they don't want it to ever happen. Again, I go back to be equitable. You've yeah. got a creator who came up with something. Don't take it all away. What do you mean yeah. you own the IP? You co-own the IP. Right. When I first came out with the Vision Quest, I was with CAA. And the, I went into a room full of people. I said, here's what I want to do. Nobody's doing this yet. And first, a lot of them just didn't understand it. They didn't understand video games. They didn't understand interactive 
storytelling. They didn't understand anything, but they saw the story and they said, we can sell that for you. And I went, it's not for sale. Find me a partner. <laughs> Let's build this out to something that can become something. You get a percentage of it because you represent me, but yeah. it's not for sale because if it's for sale, I don't get to be George Lucas. Right. And when I grow up, that's what I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, again, it goes back to equitable um, community that we all get a piece. That's what IATSE, that's what SAG, that's what mm-hmm. the WGA, that's what the DGA is fighting for. Give us a piece of this. Don't right. just take our services and say, okay, we're, you, we're done with that, throw you away. Right. No, you get a piece of it. You get a residual. You get those things. That's what will hold this community together. And those visionaries, the Walt Disney's of the world with all the issues that he had, the uh, Lou Wasserman's of the world, they were visionaries. Yeah. Samuel Goldwyn. And they, you know, they, they held on to, to those rights. But at the same time, that can change. Yeah. And that's what needs to change if we're going to, to evolve. We, we have to start taking care of each other is how I feel about it. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I completely agree. And, and, and at the, at the risk of making too big of a jump, I don't want to take up too much of your time. And I certainly want to talk about this, but, you know, speaking of, of, you know, things to kind of like share and give back, if people support the Kickstarter for Warrior One, the the tiers, there's a lot of really cool stuff that you've offered. In addition to, of course, you know, it's like if you support this level, you'll get the digital copy. If you support this level, you can get the, the paperback, the hardback, you know, and that sort of stuff. But you've also offered some really, I, I, I think, just fantastic stuff, uh, you know, and some of it's certainly geared towards people with deeper pockets. Uh, and, and, and that's totally fine. Uh, and I know that there are people out there that have those pockets because uh, I would love to talk about the, you know, the fact that you've got some original scripts that you uh, ha- have put up into some of these packages from Quantum Leap signed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the ones that you selected? Because you selected specific scripts to kind of accompany these, you, you know, these uh, backing um, reward, backer rewards, excuse me. Um, I selected the trilogy, all three scripts from the trilogy. Um, I think there's only three of them. So I, they, they will be duplicated, but they will be signed. And I selected Shock Theater for the, the second to last uh, grouping. And that that's that episode had a real meaning to me as did the the trilogy because i got to introduce and create what i was considering the next generation of quantum leap which was sam sam potter sammy joe and i still want to do that that's the movie i want to do i want to tell that story of um how she found her father um but shock theater i thought was an important episode for a whole number of reasons in that we have taken away um, the net that falls, that that catches the the mentally handicapped. Mm. And we have stopped looking at the research of what causes the mentally handicapped. And that, that those pieces of conversation that are in that script, um, And in that show, that episode, I think are incredibly important to to bring back to the surface. So it had had a real meaning for me in the sense that I think I was looking at how long ago Coca-Cola knew and all their products knew that that, uh, aspartame would eat holes in your brain and cause cancer. It's one of the reasons the health of the United States is in such turmoil because we are fed crap yeah that that's um, Monsanto um, and DuPont knew that Teflon was a forever chemical that it is in your system from every time you you know used a Teflon pan and um, we are changed because of what we have been experimenting we are we are the victims of an experiment and we're paying for it. And, and the, the health um, insurance, pharmaceuticals, 
they're not looking to take care of us. They're to, looking to take advantage of us. Those yeah. are the things I also addressed in the vision quest. In the future, we don't have insurance. We have assurance. And we assure that you will stay healthy. And or we assure that we will take care of you. Yeah. So it's really it's really a deep conversation that uh, I'm grateful I'm having. And Warrior One, you know, I need people. This is where it's really important. I need you <laughs> to come and validate this project so that Epic and um, the, the Unreal Engine say, oh, my God, yeah, this is a big deal. Let's let's give them the opportunity to use our technology to bring people together. Because to me, interactive gaming is the, the ultimate of, of community consciousness. And then to have a reason um, for that consciousness to make a better planet for us, to make a better world for us, I think is heartfelt and exciting and we can do it. Yeah. So come to warrioroneworld.com. That'll be a link to the... You should be seeing it right now. <laughs> you should be seeing it right now. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> and, what, and one of the other things that I'm offering is a lunch and a conversation. Now, it is a high ticket, but that's not to say that if enough people said, um, come talk to us, I would, have, I would definitely be open to community meetings. And that's where the Vision Quest universe will, I think, come together, that we can start these dialogues that ask the questions and maybe answer them because mm. we shift our consciousness and who knows what's going to happen. We may bring our powers back. Yeah. And I, I think in, in Ethan's piece, I wrote, you know, Jesus Christ. And he names all the, the a, a list of prophets because in the history, he walked on water. He manifested matter. He changed water into wine and made bread and loaves of fishes. So he, he said, do as I do. There may be something there. What is to <laughs> say? All of us can't do that. Why can't yeah. you hold up your hand and manifest an apple? Because the matter is here. Right. Science says it. And we That's know we know there's untapped potential. I mean, we know that that is, is true. I don't think it's talked about enough, quite frankly, but we know that there's untapped potential to the human body and the human mind and to think about ways to expand that consciousness, you know, and I'm not, you know, maybe a little bit of a hippie, but I'm not necessarily, you know, saying it in that way. But uh, but but seriously, I, I think that having those conversations and creating spaces where we can have those conversations and doing it as an extension of art is always valid and always worth it. And I think that, you know, anyone listening to this, if if, if you haven't already, you, you definitely need to head over to, you know, warrioroneworld.com and click on the Kickstarter button, find the tier that works for you. Even, you know, even if you just want to throw a few dollars, if, if you're not able to support one of the higher tiers, that's fine too. But find a tier that works for you, get the graphic novel, um, get 30 minutes of Zoom time with uh, Deborah Pratt. I, I promise you it's worth it. Uh, it's more than worth it. Um, you know, get the, get the lunch, go, go for it, go big. Uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's so many wonderful opportunities to support the project. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, not only supporting this project, but you're supporting Deborah Pratt. And that means that you could be supporting a potential quantum leap project down the road. Who knows? Um, Cause there's so many ways that this can benefit that. Um, and, and, and I know I would love to see, and we're going to see, we should probably talk just very briefly. Uh, again, I want I don't want to take up too much of your time, but we're going to see more quantum leap work from Deborah Pratt, because uh, I heard that you're going to be uh, slotted to direct one of these back five episodes that the writers are currently working on, right? That is correct. Yes. Uh, I think 211 is what I heard. So we've, that's fantastic. We've, we've shot up to 208, so we better hurry up. But right. Hey, I'm, right. Standing, I'm standing with the, with the actors as uh, the voice of Ziggy. Uh, so I've been AI for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a deep, metaphysical uh, interactivity and you know there's a lot of fun things that that when I do this feature film Ziggy is going to get to do and and we get to really explore what Sam Beckett created 
yeah. and unleashed in this <laughs> in that character. Uh, and I think that's the, the fun of something so iconic that hit, that is timeless. Yes. Yes. Well, the, you know, the heart, the humor, the history, the hope, I mean, those, those four H's and, and the way that those have been integrated into the storytelling of Quantum Leap, you know, obviously in the classic series, but even in, in the revival series as well. Um, it's, it's I'm grateful just, to Martin and Dean and all the writers. I'm very grateful that they heard and felt. I'm sorry. Yeah. I no, that's okay. I, 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 I love hearing that. I, I mean, I can certainly say having spoken to a couple of the writers that I know how much they love and appreciate you. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's always, it's always great to hear that. And, 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 and I've always said this, and I just continue to have the sense of the, the wonderful people that work on this show, and that it's a really good group of people that love getting to do this show and, and, and seeing the quality of the work and, and, and seeing someone like Raymond Lee, who uh, I, I know listeners of, of this show will certainly know how I feel, but I think he's doing just some of the most phenomenal work I'm currently seeing on television. I mean, he's just so incredibly good. He's, he's one of my favorite actors now, you know, not just, not just like, Oh, he's on one of my favorite shows. It's like, no, he's legitimately one of my favorite actors and seeing the journey that, you know, that Ben has gone on has been incredible. And to see him matched, you know, step for step by someone like Caitlin Bassett and, and, and the work that they do together. And they're just such great scene partners. And then of course, you know, to see Nan Rissa and Mason and Ernie, Ernie, Oh my gosh, I can't talk about it. We can't talk about it, but I can say this, you're going to get to see Ernie do some awesome work coming awesome up in some of the work. episodes. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's just a thrill. It seems like everyone's great people and I know that you are and you have been, and I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for your work. And I'm so grateful that you have chosen to spend a little time talking about all of this with me. Um, and I will certainly continue to tell everyone to head over to warrioroneworld.com, support the Kickstarter. Let's get this thing made so that we can just, you know, we can kick this off and there will be more and there'll be all these wonderful things that can come out of it, including the game. I, I want to, I want to play a game like that. It sounds amazing. I can't tell you, I had a girl start to cry when I told her of the idea of the Warrior One game. She says, I mm. need this game. I need to know that I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And I, I feel honored, incredibly honored by that. And I think the contact at warrioroneworld.com, um, you can go and write directly um, to war to me. Um, there's an address in there uh, that I, those emails come to me. So if you have a question, if you have a thought, and, and I do my best to try and answer the ones, the same contact um, at thevisionquest.com. Uh, those emails come to me. You know, a lot of people said, send me your picture. I want to sign an autograph picture and stuff. And then Amazon <laughs> has the Vision Quest books. And I, I swear to you, I'm going to, I am going to finish book five. <laughs> written. I just, there's something that it needs that I have to put in. And once I do that, it'll be out. Yeah, it's great too because the Vision Quest novels that are available over at Amazon, if you have Kindle Unlimited, of course you can you can access them through Kindle Unlimited uh, without you know uh, paying an additional fee, or of course you can buy them directly for your Kindle, or you can get the paperback versions of the books. Um, and uh, yeah, I I just I I started I started reading the first one this past week, and I admit to it had been something I've been meaning to do for a, a while, quite frankly. Um, but uh, knowing that, that we were going to be chatting, I wanted to start reading. And um, I have I have lots more questions, quite frankly. I, I really do. I didn't get to hardly any of them just because I enjoy talking to you. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful stuff. And, 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 and I do genuinely, I mean, obviously, I appreciate your work so much. And so I'm glad to be able to have the opportunity to continue to support it and uplift it in any way that I possibly can, small as though it may be. Um, but thank you so 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 much for being here deborah i really appreciate it thank you thank you for believing in me thank you all for believing in me and this is only the beginning absolutely Deborah is fantastic and such a joy. Um, it is it is seriously my privilege to be able to share that with you. Um, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, it's a fascinating window into her other creative endeavors because you know 
Deborah's creating and writing and, and quantum leap clearly is something that has been uh, embedded in her soul and something that is incredibly important to her and something that she still wants to be a part of, but it's not the only thing um, that she does. And, and clearly the vision quest is something that is very important to her as well. Something that uh, has been in her mind for a very long time, you know, since she was a teenager. So uh, I think again, head over to the Kickstarter. If you've not already backed um, back it and let's get more your one made um, and see what what we can accomplish next. Um, not only do we get more graphic novels, maybe a video game, but who knows, maybe we'll save the world. So uh, it's a lofty goal, but those are the ones worth having. Uh, in addition to that, of course, some great stuff about Quantum Leap. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to having Deborah on again. Uh, it's something that, that we'll certainly cook up. Um, and in the meantime, thank you all so, so very much. If you want to support this show first, before you do any of that, Take a look at the world around you. See what you can do to help out. Set some right, uh, set some wrongs right, and uh, and by all means, you know, volunteer time or your money if you if you're able to. Uh, local charities, if you're looking for something in the world uh, at large, of course, Doctors Without Borders and the Trevor Project are two of my favorite charities, and I will certainly always endorse them. The work that they do. Uh, furthermore, um, you know, there's there's a lot uh, a lot of hurt right now going out in the world, and uh, sometimes um, just a little kindness to uh, um, your fellow humans is, is enough to really make someone's day. So um, never fail to be kind. And um, in the meantime, take care of yourselves. Take care of one another. Stay safe out there. Oh, yeah. And you can head over to the Patreon if you want to. Um, to, to, to support this show. Um, but, uh, but after you do all that, remember to always, always, always leap responsibly. <laughs>